Well, welcome to another episode of the DRI show. As usual, in each episode, I'll be talking to interesting people within psychology, mental health, and well-being. Today, I'm joined by a psychologist, speaker, and author, Audrey Tang. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Dennis. It's great to have you here, Audrey. So let's start off with you telling us your backstory, your trajectory in life, and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Great. Okay. Well, I followed two paths simultaneously, psychology and theatre, uh, practicing both, using both, engaging in both, uh, largely as a teacher, but also I produce a lot of community theatre. Um, I really began to specialise after I did my PhD. So that's where I focused more on the academic side of psychology, allowing the theatrical side to be more of a hobby. However, I found the two suit each other really well because all of my uh, knowledge and all of the experience I have through directing, through creating characters, through watching other people and saying to them things like, oh, that's coming across as angry, or do you mean to come across like that? Or how are you trying to express yourself? All of that feeds in so beautifully to my coaching, to my training, because I can now notice when somebody's behaving in a certain way, I can actually ask them about it, I can call them on it. And that's a lot through what I've learned um, through observation in drama. Um, brilliant. And of course, um, is that really a, a straightforward path for many psychologists or for many counsellors and just like what you said you you pick up bits and pieces from your life experiences but one thing that you did not mention Audrey and I found out about it is that you're also the founder of Click Training and you're a development coach and you're a training consultant so please tell us about it. Of course yes um I taught for a long time. I taught in a secondary school and then I moved on to become a trainer, after which I thought, you know what, I think I can do this on my own. And I started delivering training sessions. And so what I do under the uh, Click Training name is that I support students. Usually I work in universities and I run courses alongside the academic work of business schools, law schools and so on. And I provide students with the skills that they don't teach you academically. Things like embedding confidence, public speaking, dealing with interviews, presentation skills, um, but also the soft skills that are so important for leadership uh, today. So that's really where my training comes in. But through training, I also um, have developed special sort of unique immersive sessions. So for example, I teach customer service using professional actors. So that's where the drama comes in, where rather than give the delegates, you play this, someone else plays that, which feels a little bit like GCSE drama. What I do instead is I have professional actors who are briefed with the very things that particular company wants to address. The actors create the role of that person or that type of customer. And what we do is we give the delegates an opportunity to practice their own skills with that professional actor who is briefed to look out for certain behaviors, certain things, and adjust their performance accordingly. Now, what's wonderful about this is it's a really safe environment for delegates to practice their skills in but not only that they are able to be videoed if they allow us to do that and then they can watch themselves and reflect on what they did and the wonderful thing about that immersive experience is that it's inconsequential the only thing that will come out of it is learning you're not going to lose your company money and that's the same thing with my escape room as well i do a tabletop escape where i look at team dynamics um it basically playing an escape game on a table. And there I can again observe, give feedback. So when somebody behaves in a certain way, I can point it out to them, I can ask them about it, and it allows them a way in to a bit of self-reflection, self-discovery, which they otherwise may not have had, because I think the best form of reflection comes through experience in the first place. Uh, and of course, um, aside from the many things that you um, coach people, um, you, you, you try to help um, a range of companies and individuals. Another thing that you also work on is about resilience. Now, um, I've been reading um, lots of literatures and lots of articles about resilience, and there seemed to be one recurring theme is that you can't actually define what resilience is. So I suppose I'll, I'll ask you um, straight away, how, how would you define resilience? 
<laughs> well, that, that is the big question. A lot of people say it's bouncing back because it's from Resilier. It's uh, the, the Latin and the French. And I actually say it's it's not bouncing back to where you were. If you bounce, if you bounce any ball, it often goes higher or lower than where it started. Mm. So for me, resilience is about navigating three dips. The first dip mm. is after the point of crisis, you have to survive. That's the most common form of describing resilience. It's survival through crisis. But for me, that doesn't end there. The next dip that happens is actually exhaustion. So when you're running on adrenaline, when you're surviving a crisis, actually, you have support from the community, you've got support from other people, you've, you're drawing from every bit of strength you have, you can pretty much do that. But when you come back down again, when you're exhausted, you then have to rebuild. So that's the second dip. Now, the third bit is where my positive psychology uh, approach comes in. Because the third bit after you've rebuilt is when you get back to normal to where you were before. But actually, why stop there? Resilience can be just as much about going beyond normal. Why stop at ordinary? And in fact, the third dip is having competition at that stage of normality, at that stage of ordinary, and being able to thrive past that. So you've got that crisis into survival, exhaustion into rebuilding, which is a bit higher, and then competition, but thriving. So for me, resilience is those three particular dips that you navigate upwards from. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's um, a really um, brilliant framework on how we could better understand resilience. Now, I understand, Audrey, that you also wrote a book about this. Um, so yeah. tell us about your book and also if you could just um, give us some tips on how we could actually improve our levels of resilience, which is, of course, very important, um, especially, you know, with, with the um, pandemic and everything. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, the Leader's Guide to Resilience is part of the Leader's Guide uh, series from Pearson. Uh, so it's my third book now and it covers my model. But in particular with resilience, the biggest thing is if you start building it up at the point of crisis, you may never get as strong as you could have got if you'd started building it earlier at the time where you actually may not have felt you needed it. Now, ways in which you can even think now about how can I actually really build my resilience is, first of all, being you and knowing you authentically. That's the first thing is knowing you yourself, because when it comes to the dips of resilience, it's you that's going to have to put in the work to get there. So by knowing who you are, and that would be thinking about what I, I like this exercise, it's called um, vitals. So the first thing you think about is the V, it's your values. Identify what is important to you. What are your values? And then when you know what they are, you probably have two or three of them. Work to live those values every single day. And what you'll find is people who have similar values, they'll gravitate to you. But actually those, even if they were friends before, who don't share those values, they may start drifting off, but that doesn't really matter quite so much. So that's the V. The I is remember your interests because interests are what make us feel nice and positive and happy. So our interests are things that made us smile in the past. And we need that. We need to feel good as well, because when we feel good, we are actually stronger to take on more things. Um, T is actually, um, it, it's it, temper, temperament. What is your natural temperament? It doesn't matter whether you're fast tempered, for example, if you're quick to anger or you're very slow and reflective, it doesn't matter. But know which one you are. It's not that one is better than another. One may be more effective in a different context than compared to another. But what you'll find is if you know what you are, you may find if you're adapting it a lot, you're never quite feeling comfortable. So try and find an area in which you're comfortable. So that's your V, your values, your interests and your temperament. Um, a is around the clock, whether you're a morning person, evening person, know which one you are, because realistically, we only have 24 hours in a day. And of them, only about six are really productive. So you may as well make the most of the really productive ones to so know what you're like around the clock. L is what's meaningful, your life goals. 
research has shown that when we have a purpose, we really function and flourish better. So know what your life goals are and aim for them, aim for that purpose. And finally, know your strengths. If you concentrate on those six things that are personal to you, that's the one of the best places to start building your resilience. But then also think a bit wider, think about your friendships and mm -hmm. think about those around you who can support you. Mm -hmm. that, that is really a good thing, um, acronym, right, Maurice? And of course, um, it's really vital that we promote our levels of resilience in order to, you know, um, efficiently navigate um, what we're experiencing. And um, I'm just drawn to us on your background, um, mindfulness, um, of course, um, in our quest to try to improve our lives and trying to make it a little less mud, we try to implement changes in our lifestyle. And of course, one of those is um, mindfulness. So if you could just give us some practical tips um, on how to implement um, mindfulness. Do you also have another acronym for mindfulness? <laughs> well, I've got some other tips. There are many um, exercises mm. we can use for mindfulness. And what I like to say about mindfulness and resilience, it's almost two sides of um, the same coin. Mindfulness allows us to broaden our awareness. It allows us to use more capacity in our brain. Uh, it allows us to find a space of calm and a, a point where, at which we can press pause. But resilience is actually what gives us the courage to take action. So while mindfulness calms us, resilience arms us, and you kind of need both to really get, get going. But one of the best things I like to do for mindfulness is gratitude. The practice of gratitude has already shown through um, uh, in neurology and neuropsychology that it changes the pathways in our brain the more we practice gratitude the more we see things in a positive way and it's one way that we can simply start off our day by being mindful if we just when we get up in the morning is do a bit of a gratitude stretch just simply you know as we stretch our arms think about one person we are so grateful to have in our lives and maybe stretch our legs and think about one thing we're grateful to have in our lives and then as we give ourselves that you know that big yawn and stretch Think about one thing we're looking forward to today. And that's a great way to start the day. But also, if you practice that particular exercise again and again, I mean, as a psychologist, as you know, you're always looking for patterns in data. Um, you'll notice certain things and certain people will always pop up in that that um, giving thanks, the people that you're grateful for, the things you're grateful for. Simply spend more time with those people, spend more time engaged in those things and you'll feel much more energized. So that's one of my favorite mindfulness tips. Um, thank you for that, Audrey. Well, uh, we already briefly alluded to this earlier. Um, I, I was um, mentioning to you about um, the uh, another lockdown that we're going to likely have. But um, as a psychologist, could you give us some tips on how we could look after our mental health and well-being um, in, in the middle of the lockdown? Certainly, yes. Um, one thing that lockdown, I think, has taught me is to really think about what and who I value because um, with lockdown it's actually stopped us doing a number of things and so my calendar has reduced but it's not necessarily reduced in an awful way there's certain things which I no longer do that I'm actually quite happy about so as lockdown releases be mindful of that be aware of the things that you really enjoyed doing that you missed whilst we were locked down and focus on those first uh, try not to spread yourself too thinly. Um, so that would be one thing. Also, another thing is social contact. Now, I know that talking like this um, using technology is not the same as seeing somebody face to face. And if you can, even if it is at social distance, it is always lovely to do that. But even with with keeping in touch, it's really important to A, keep in touch with those you love and want to be in touch with. But also remember that not everybody necessarily responds in the same way as you. So if you love social um, contact, if you love hugs, if you're missing all of that, that's great. But remember, not everyone else does. And sometimes other people might be sitting there actually dreading the time that lockdown lifts because now they haven't got an excuse to see to not see people anymore. So just be mindful that people may not be lonely during lockdown. They may be enjoying the solitude, too. So I think what's good about um, 
this time is we have a chance to think about what makes us really happy and what we find is really important and perhaps reassess our work, our career, our finances. We've got that time to stop and take stock, but also we've got time to rebuild in a way that we're going to enjoy our life more, but just be aware that other people are doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, just to add to that, um, Audrey, um, of course, we could also use our extra time to discover other interests, other issues that just that just ties in with um, what the acronym you just gave earlier, um, vitals and um, interest is the letter I. Um, I, I took note of that because I love I, I love the acronym. Um, now, let's move on to another aspect of what you do, um, aside from resilience and aside from mindfulness, you also um, an expert about leadership. And in fact, you've written um, a number of books about it. Now, yeah. uh, someone who's done extensive research on leadership, what would you say is the most difficult part of being a leader? Um, for me, I talk about leadership and say, you are really a leader when you have followers. So leadership in title alone does not a leader make. And this is where I think a lot of people fall prey to that mistake they think oh well i've got the title i'm a leader now and actually they don't necessarily put themselves across in a way that encourages other people to follow them so they may be a leader in title alone and are they really generating um the following the ethos that they want so the first thing is really when you're a leader you must behave in a way that will generate followers that you want the second point is um, never underestimate the importance of ethics and integrity. A lot of the time, the pandemic has shown us the wonderful compassion and human heart that everybody has, but it's also revealed some tone deaf behaviors from, from people who are influencers, leaders, and so on. And that's difficult to come back from. Always be aware that a reputation can actually be uh, smashed in seconds. It is important to practice what you preach, to work to live your values, not just speak about them, uh, and to make sure that you do the work as well. Although the mindset of the leader and the manager is one of coordination, supporting, growth, getting things done by empowering others, it is important that you yourself knows what has to be done in order to do the work. So, for example, it's sometimes too easy for leaders to shout at their, their teams and say, well, I need it done uh, yesterday. But actually, if you've not given the instruction with enough time how can that even happen you're setting people up to fail and that happens often when you have no understanding of the job in hand as well so while your skill set is different to doing the work at least know what the work involves as well mm -hmm. and i would imagine this is one of the you know snippets of wisdom that you shared on your book um be a great manager so if you could just tell us the background um, about that book and what exactly is the book all about. And um, I could only suspect that because earlier you mentioned that you've been on different um, career trajectories. Um, you, you've been um, at one time you've, you flirted with um, being an actress and you also become a teacher. So I would imagine that um, along the way you've, you've been exposed to different kinds of managerial styles and that kind of informed this book. Is that right? Spot on. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yes. Um, the book Be a Great Manager now, everyone just assumes straight away, oh, she must be a manager and she must be. Uh, yes, I have managed. I have run businesses um, and I, I have run a number of productions with volunteers as well, which is management in a very different way because you're having to manage there without the incentive of money. But largely the book was conceived through a lot of experiences with poor managers. Yes, I've worked under some wonderful managers too, and I will always be grateful to them. But you learn so much from poor management too. Every experience that you have counts. And so all of this time when I was getting angry with what I was being put through or what I was going through and I was getting stressed, I was also reflecting on, well, what could I do instead? What would have been a more effective thing to do here? And so my book, Be a Great Manager Now, is 
full of practical tips um, and again practical support for for managers that has come out of my own experience from good managers and working under poor managers but also through my training sessions uh, when I was doing a lot of leadership training for the NHS and my experiences with managers there too so just as an example one chapter in be a great manager now is largely focused on why we do need to know policies and procedures and a lot of people find that very boring they don't want to read about them but if you are trying to manage a team and you actually don't know what the standard procedure is and you don't know what people do how on earth are you supposed to help yourself manage others it's the same thing with even teachers because you can apply it across different fields if you're going to a new school don't come with your old disciplinary policy, go and find out what the new one is, because that is what the children are used to. That's what is going on. And that's just not with discipline, it's with, with all the different policies. That's just the first one that, that came to mind uh, um, just now. So that's some of the things that I put in the Be A Great Manager book. I also look there at our social media usage and how that can help, but it can also hinder us terribly. And even things like um, telling a manager that maybe when they do take that promotion is to ask themselves, well, is there a different promotion they wanted? Not everyone who whose natural next step is in management really wants to be a manager. And one of my most successful kind of it, it, happenings after a training session on management is when people come out of that saying you know what I thought I wanted to manage because it was my next step up on the promotional ladder but really I don't want to do that instead I want to become um, somebody who specializes in helping other teachers teach or I want to become a specialist in my head as a head of department not a head of head of year or head of school and I think that's a wonderful reflection too that management is not necessarily for everybody Exactly. And I, I suppose one of the important aspects of being um, an efficient manager is that you don't just look for, you know, um, the, the financial aspects of running a business, but more importantly, you also look after the mental health and well-being of your employees. So um, I understand that you also uh, like deliver sessions for um, a range of companies. So would you say that um, for, for the past um, several years that you've been doing this, um, you've seen a significant increase of, of companies, you know, um, getting the services of people such, such as yourself. That's a really good question. And the reason why it's so good is, yes, mm -hmm. on the face of it, I have been asked to deliver more. Um, conferences have been about well-being, so I've been asked to speak at those. Um, and it does seem to be that well-being is on the agenda a lot more. However, whether people go further than ticking that box, we did the conference, we had the speaker in, we had the training session, or whether they actually use the data and the information and all of the different practical exercises and activities that were explored and then take it forward is completely a different matter. So yes, on the one hand, a lot of companies are focused on well-being, but how many of them are really focused beyond we think we ought to do it is still for me sadly open to debate. And, and of course, um, one thing that we also tend to um, neglect is that certain sectors do not actually have the same advantage of, you know, um, having a workplace mental health in place within within the system. Um, so, say, for instance, um, the creative industry, because a lot of people in the creative industry, and uh, I, I know you would you 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 would have a first-hand experience of this. Um, you know, people in the theaters and actors, they don't have an HR department to turn to. So I think that's another thing that people such as yourself could, you know, um, um, be able to help people within certain sectors to um, think more about their mental health and well-being. Yes. Um, and I think the options for uh, getting mental health and well-being on the agenda of every single field, there's so much, so many 
areas where you can actually um, bring in mental health, where you can actually bring in resilience and building up that mental fortitude. And certainly I've been approached, I did um, a piece on wellbeing for a wonderful stand-up group called the Balkan Comedy Bubble, which was absolutely lovely. So that is uh, bringing in wellbeing into the performing industry. But the big thing I recognize, and you'll know this yourself from the work that you do, is that um, people often don't necessarily think they need any help or any extra resilience support or even mindfulness until they need it. And so it's almost also about being present so that if people need you, they know how to find you. And then having at least some content out there, like your wonderful blog, Psych Reg, that's, that's fantastic. But having those facilities out there to be able to uh, draw from and people can access them whenever they, they need to and then perhaps go for more if they then go, oh, actually, I do need that. Oh, and here's a link to the author who's also a coach and so on. So I think that's, that's where we can actually only be there but we can't force people to look after their mental health. Exactly. Um, I'd like to echo what you said. We're really making significant progress um, when it comes to mental health. We talk more about it. In fact, um, it, uh, on Saturday it will be World Mental Health Day. So it's another avenue for us to, you know, um, keep on talking about awareness. Because essentially, the more we talk about it, the more solutions we will be able to come up. But I'd just like to follow up um, my question because earlier you said that the performing industry, um, um, we, we can bring in some, you know, uh, something to the table to talk more about mental health. But what about um, men's mental health? Because um, I'm also a member of um, a group called the Male Psychology Network. And one thing that we, we um, explore within that organization is that why is it that men, um, it's already 2020, they seem to still be reluctant about talking mental health. Um, certainly it's not it's not just, you know, the, the lazy argument that it's all about stigma and stereotype of mental health. Um, what would you say are other variables that come into play? Another variable is how easy it is for someone to express themselves. And we say that with children all the time, but it seems to be more acceptable with children because we sit there and go, well, children have a more limited vocabulary. They haven't learned ways of expressing themselves. But actually, that's the same with everybody. It's all very well even having the access to the service. So you talk about men's mental health. Yes, we have now stress consultants rather than stress counsellors. So the word itself sounds a little bit more enticing to men. Whether we need to or not is another matter, but that's what happens. But even if men access the service, you still need to rely on that person to be able to express themselves, to really explain what's going on, to have reflected on it, to have thought about it. And also, this is where you sometimes get a problem from in, in the in relationships where perhaps the, maybe the partner may be more expressive, but then puts their impression and their perception onto you and onto what you're feeling and thinking. And that doesn't allow you that clarity of thought to express yourself. So those can be extra issues that when you you think you need help, but then you finally sought help. But now what actually, how can I say it? Am I really thinking that or did someone tell me I'm thinking that? Those are extra ways that, that the matter can be confused. Um, another example I would give is, is grieving. Um, men and women, for example, grieve quite differently. And this can actually result in relationship woes as men may want to just go and not talk about it, but they might do something really physical to really get that emotion out that way. But a woman may want to talk about things more and they may feel they're being shut out. And then it might be that the man doesn't really want to deal with the woman who's overly emotional by their perceptions because it makes them feel awkward. And that sort of breakdown in communication doesn't help anybody. So in the first instance, I think we're already tackling uh, when it comes to men men mental health accessibility, but um, that still doesn't answer the question. And this is not just for men, but for maybe children, for different cultures as well. It doesn't tackle the question of how well you can express what you're feeling and how well you even understand what you're feeling once you are in a position to get help. Mm -hmm. Now, Audrey, on your line of work, you also 
um, exposed to different um, groups, to different personalities, and of course, you try to adapt your your um, your, your the way you work. Um, would you be able to um, give um, strengths and disadvantages of, um, let's say, individual coaching compared to group therapy? It's horses for courses. I know that's not a great answer, but it depends on what you feel you benefit best by. I started right at the beginning by talking about the self when it comes to resilience, because you're the one who's going to do the work, whether it's weight loss, whether it's fitness, whether it's emotional and mental health. If you work better with the support of a group, if you work better having the accountability of a group, great. A group may be advantageous because you've got lots of people who can give different ideas, who can give their perspective and give their experience. But then you may not want to share quite so honestly because there's lots of people who are there. And even though there's always a confidentiality agreement, you don't necessarily know how confidential people's version of confidential is. But then one to one, what if you don't have a good rapport with the therapist or what if um, somebody else might have actually had a, an idea or said the same idea in a way that you could connect with but then again one-to-one -one, you might have more directed time you've got um somebody who has got to know you very well um you've got somebody who can tailor the support to your needs specifically you may find yourself being able to be more honest which always helps the therapist certainly i find one-to-one -one, i can pick up on nuances on little movements little changes in body language which is why i always do my uh, sessions face to face or on some kind of um platform or in person when we could be when we could be socially distanced or when we could actually see each other and so it depends on what you prefer and what's going to help you best as to which whether you choose group or individual or simply whether you choose to use an app or choose to use a forum but of course be very very careful with what which ones you use and even when it comes to choosing therapists make sure they are accredited as well now um t tell us about um chrissy b show because um you are the resident psychologist of the chrissy b show which um holds the title of the only mental health and well-being show in the country. Um, tell us more about the show. Um, incidentally, I was talking to um, Chrissy B, um, I think about um, two or three weeks ago. And um, I, I don't know if you remember me, but I was on your show, um, I think two years ago. Yes, um, I do remember you and I saw the interview as well. Wonderful interview. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So so tell us more about the show and um, why why we should be watching um, this show compared to, let's say, some reality show, I suppose. Oh, well, <laughs> um, first of all, it's just lovely to have a really positive show about mental health. It's, yes, we do cover subjects like depression and grief and loss and suicide and all of the really painful areas, but even our life stories, it's all about telling people that you're not alone and you can get through it. It's inspirational. It's It's got a positive message. And that's what's so wonderful about the show itself. And what's lovely about every guest we've had is that they tell their story, their experiences and what they went through, but also how they got through it. And if that just hits one person out there and they just think, I'm not alone and I can do this, then that's absolutely wonderful. Um, the show itself also has a lot of expert guests. You've got nutritionists, organizers, makeup artists, got a GP, coaches, and it's it's got a wonderful range of different skills it, all in one place. So I would definitely say if you need that that energy boost, if you need that uh, that little little hit to make you feel you know what i can do this i can achieve that inspiration it's a wonderful show to watch now when you come to compare a show like the chrissy b show with reality tv you will find that people do have a tendency to gravitate to that reality tv um for very different reasons um and unfortunately with reality tv it has also been highly uh, associated with people feeling insecure about their bodies, with an uptake in plastic surgery, in uh, in self-esteem plummeting, especially at younger ages. And 
a problem with reality TV and the vitriol that can actually come out of that is that sometimes when we watch things um, which are effectively telling us a narrative, a story. Now, the Chrissy B show doesn't have a narrative apart from we want you to be well and we want you to take the steps to to make yourself well. Um, but if there's a narrative that's been constructed, which reality TV shows will always do, you have a villain, you've got a, a sweet character, you've got the love interest, you've got all of those different types of uh, the archetypes. Um, if we have gone through something and we haven't quite worked through it ourselves, we can start associating our feelings of anger, of sadness with the people who are going through something or who are behaving in a certain way. And that can explain some of the horrible behaviors you then see on social media, where people are criticizing other human beings in quite a, a vitriolic and unpleasant way and almost forgetting that they're real people as well. And that in it, in turn can perpetuate mental illness. Whereas the Chrissy B Show is a firm believer in mental health and taking mental health for yourself. Exactly. I'm a huge fan of what you do because it's really rare that you would find a show that really, um, you know, puts a different perspective about mental health. Um, um, you, we just did um, um, a, a bit of a comparison with other um, kinds of shows. Now, you've been very active when it comes to, you know, within the mental health landscape, you're a psychologist, you're, you're a consultant, and you've you also um, um, been teaching at one point. Um, so who has the greatest influence um, on, on your work? Is there a particular book? Is there a particular individual who kind of informed the, the way you, you approach your work as a psychologist? Um, it keeps changing, actually. There are a number of wonderful influences. Uh, Professor Brene Brown, uh, The Call to Courage, that's that's one of the books I'd recommend. Absolutely wonderful speaker. Do watch her on Netflix as well at the moment. So she's somebody who influences me a lot in what she says. But right now, I'm actually reading um, Maria Konnikova and... Um, Annie Duke, both wonderful writers, and both have actually been talking about poker playing. Um, and one thing that Annie Duke says is she's written a book called Thinking in Bets. And it's recently changed my perspective and understanding of what I'm actually striving for. I talk a lot about values and I talk about um, being authentic to who we are ourselves and uh, having values of integrity and loyalty and so on. But one thing Annie Duke says is, when it comes to um, information, we need to actually always do a double check on what we say and how we put ourselves across by asking ourselves, would I bet on that? So if we're going to say a statement, if we're going to say, you know, X number of people um, sought mental health in the last sought mental health help in the last year, um, before we say that with certainty, we need to ask ourselves, would I put a bet on that statement? And I'd like to expand that and actually say that when it comes to your values and when it comes to who you are as a person, I think it's really important to strive to be the sort of person that you would put a bet on yourself and to have friends who you would put a bet on. Because when it comes to really thinking in bets, it's about putting your money where your mouth is. And the minute you suddenly think, oh my goodness, I would actually be putting my money on that person. I'd be putting that money on myself. Would I live up to that? And I think that's an incredibly powerful way of looking at things. So they are some of my key influences. And I'm actually really influenced by Ryan Murphy, who you'll know from the, you know, the writer of American Horror Story and um, O.J. Simpson and Versace, all of those. Uh, for me, he has worked really hard to get to where he is. And now he's one of the people who always hires, he, he, he pose is largely transgender. And um, it's really bringing from the community, writing about the community and not maligning anybody to secondary roles, but actually putting different communities front and center. He's looked at mental illness with Ratchet. He's looked at um, the, the environment issues with the politician. He's looking at transgender with Pose. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. That's somebody who's got to where he is and then is using his platform to spread the, the positivity in a very different way, but just as powerfully. And um, also what I'd like to ask you, Audrey, is um, what's the most important thing you want the public to know about your work? I mean, you're very active, like what I've said, um, within the mental health landscape, but what's the big message that you want people to take away? 
The biggest message is positive psychology, which is the school of thought that I come from, is not just about getting you from having mental illness back to normal. It can actually start at the point of normal and help you to thrive. So my biggest message to everybody is why stop at ordinary, thrive. That's a brilliant message. Um, life is special to the ordinary. I've heard that um, somewhere else. Um, can you also tell us some of the misconceptions about positive psychology that you've come across? Oh, yes. A lot of people sort of feel positive psychology is a bit, oh, it's just a bit Pollyanna. It's a bit happy clappy. It's a bit, you know, um, that there's no real substance to it. And the thing about positive psychology is generally it's not there to be used alone unless it is from the place of ordinary or normal to thriving. It goes hand in hand with support for mental illness, whether that comes from the somatic school of thought, whether that comes from cognitive behavioral therapy or the established therapies. It's not sitting there saying it's an alternative. It's it's there as a bolt on. It's an add on. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions. A lot of the time people think that positive psychology is an alternative. It's it's not. It's there as an extra additional support. And that's where the research has shown that people who have looked at um, ways they can support themselves through building up their resilience, building up their own self-compassion, their ability to cope, or their ability to manage emotions. That's actually complemented all of the other help that they're getting as well through the other professional and more classic ways of supporting through mental illness. So it's not an alternative. It is an add-on, but it's an add-on that has shown to have had results. Mm -hmm. um, I, I absolutely agree with that um, because I also um, promote the idea of writing therapy um, because I, I'm a black guy also. Um, but what, what I tell to people is that um, some form of therapy is not going to work for everyone. Gardening therapy may not be for you. Writing therapy uh, may not be for you. But like what you've said, it's it's not really a replacement, but it's a supplement to existing therapies. And, you know, when we're trying to look for ways to promote positive mental health, we really have to, you know, look at it as a, as a constellation of different things that might work for different people. Now, um, Audrey, you always encourage people um, to, you know, to relax. But personally, how do you relax? What's your distressing outlet? Uh, um I, I love to read, um, but reading can still sometimes be a little bit um, a, adrenaline boosting if I get really into something. So I think my favorites will probably be curling up with my dog. Um, I, I, I love animals anyway, but I find pets very therapeutic and actually seeing my friends and and seeing them without having my phone out it makes such a difference when you consciously enjoy spending time with the people you love there is nothing more i mean for me i look at because you've asked me how how i relax i look at i look at relaxation as either relaxing as in calm or recharging both i think are important and you are maybe the type of person who prefers one over the other and i actually find when i'm with my friends um it re-energizes me and so it means that i can give a better service when i'm working anyway but also for the things that exhaust me if i've been re-energized i've actually kind of got a fuller battery to be able to cope with those things so Yes, sometimes the odd spa, the odd meditation. I, I run every morning um, either watching a meditation or um, something sort of positive to set me up for the day. Um, that that can work. But for me, it's that re-energizing sense of being around people who whom I love and who love me and who I feel really comfortable with. That's to me the most energizing thing of all. Mm -hmm. uh, and those things are really important, especially with your line of work, because um, a lot of people in your um, profession say that sometimes they could also experience burnout or, um, you know, um, I, I forgot the word, but you 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 already ran out of empathy. Uh, I forgot the technical word for that. Yeah. Um, um, but but um, as, as what's your key advice for people within your line of profession that you always try to, you know, you always try to help people with their mental health. And in the process, you tend to, you know, forget um, about your own mental health. You 
cannot save people from themselves is the first thing. Um, but in doing a good job for other people, you do a better job if you always remember that you're the person doing it and therefore to recharge yourself and to re-energize yourself. You can only be as strong as you actually are, which means that if you are just giving everything and you're not replenishing, then how on earth can you give a better service to other people? Um, I, I always say about self-care is that you care for you in order to care better for others. And and I think that's that's the key message. And yeah, absolutely. I, I know the word and I can't think of it either. When you run out of empathy and you you run out of compassion, you run out of um, of, of energy to help. I remember others. it now, compassion fatigue. fatigue. That's it. That's it. That's it. it. And it does happen. And what I would also say is if you can recognize the triggers just before you get there, act on them. One of the things about mindfulness is all about recognizing the triggers. But if you then do nothing about it, what's the point of even recognizing them? So if you do realize that, oh, hang on a minute, I do need to take a step back now. You're going to have to take it because it's better that you do it there than later on. And yes, I know people who are so compassionate, who go into the care professions. They see it as a calling and and they say, you know, but if I don't help um, then who will? And I, I really do understand that. But if you burn yourself out, who could help as well as you could? And how many more people could you have helped had you not burnt yourself out? And who is going to be able to to pick up where you leave off as well? So it is important to know what your boundaries are. Exactly. That's part of it. And um, also, Audrey, what would you be doing if you didn't work as a psychologist? Oh, I like that question. I think I, I would have that little fervent dream to be an actress. Uh, I mean, I, I made it into Spectre. So <laughs> that was my that was my, my um, five seconds of fame there. <laughs> what was your yeah, role on, on, on the Spectre, if I may ask? Um, it's it's in the scene where uh, C is talking to all of the different nations of the Nine Eyes. Mm. There is one... Don't um, tell me the Chinese woman. China. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, look for that. <laughs> I'm there. It was so funny. My dad mm. explained Spectre as, oh, yeah, that's that film with all of the, the that really long helicopter chase and you're in a meeting. Yes. Yes, Dad. Thank you. That is exactly what Spectre is. Okay. And um, finally, um, Audrey, what else is in the pipeline? Um, well, the first is getting my getting my leader's guide to resilience launched. That will be due out um, hopefully, if not this month, beginning of next. So very, very soon. Um, and that's with Pearson and Financial Times. Um, that's probably the big thing for me at the moment. Um, still doing little bits and pieces for the Chrissy B show. So watch out for those on um, Chrissy's IGTV. That's the Chrissy B show IGTV. Um, I'm, I'm still teaching and what is big for me right now is delivering webinars for university is really how to give that webinar the same experience and the same level of connection that I can give them when I'm face to face, but when I'm actually behind a camera, because even as enthusiastic and as exciting as I can be, it's not the same trying to reach 200 people like this compared with being in a lecture theatre where you can see what people are doing and you can feel the room. So that's a big challenge for me at the moment is continuing teaching in that way. And finally, I mean, it's one of my, my pleasures at the moment to be um, consulting for a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, architectural firm called WATG. And I'm brought in to support their landscape team under John Goldwyn, who's also written forward for the Leader's Guide to Resilience. Um, and they are really embedding well-being into their designs. And that's absolutely exciting and incredible. So that's a big step for me, very, very new step for me that I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring. Well, we're looking forward to hear more about your work. 
And um, I understand you have a website, so I'll pop in um, your link to the video description box. Um, well, it's been an insightful conversation with you, Dr. Audrey Tang, um, but unfortunately, our time is up. Um, thank you for sharing your time and expertise, and I look forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Dennis.